Um, since this is not really planned, I'm going to go extremely informal. Anyone who has questions, like raise a hand and shout it at me. <laughs> and, uh, yes, Andy? <clears throat> Andy? Andy wants to make sure that their hand raising works, and it does. Uh, yeah. Uh, so for those who don't know, my name is Ben Hibben. I go by the Blendster. I have co-founded a little company called Mr. Blinky Bling with Charles Lehman, who's the hat over there. We've been teaching soldering in uh, Hardware Hacker Village. This is our second year here. This is uh, one of our favorite cons of all time to teach people at because we have such amazing people coming by and learning from us. And uh, we get a lot of very emotionally rewarding feedback, which is good because this is not a very uh, financially rewarding <laughs> thing. Uh, but that's volunteering. I, I, I'm a chronic volunteer. I volunteer too much. Uh, it is a it's a good problem to have, I think, personally, because I'm making the world a better place in some small way. But uh, uh, my landlord likes to remind me that I do just need to do more paying work from time to time. <laughs> uh, again, I apologize. I'm a ramble. Um, so, yeah, um, Charles and I met at the Level 1 Hackerspace, which uh, Charles, Andy, and I are also representing. Uh, it is a 501c educational nonprofit in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have been able to discover it very early days, I think the third or fourth meeting in their space, about six months after the initial founders started meeting in a bar and got enough rent money together to get a space. Uh, they were, they, we were in the back of an old oriental massage parlor. Yes, that is exactly what you think it was. And uh, <laughs> it was a fire trap. It was uh, severely underdeveloped, the building had been basically gutted and poorly put back together. Uh, the notion, you know, this is not a knock on the landlords, the, the notion was that they would uh, just kind of let whatever new tenant would move in, restructure it the way they wanted it to, and they'd had a hard time finding a tenant. And uh, uh, insurance for an empty building is way higher than insurance for an occupied building. So we were able to come to an arrangement with them to uh, rent this space for a ridiculously low amount of money, 500 bucks a month. Yeah, that was, <laughs> there you go, I see what you did there. <laughs> so, um, uh, oh, although while we're on that topic, I would like to say that I stand with Jason Street's comments. Uh, more, more or less, I agree with him on the need for empathy and treating people like humans, and I am generally in complete agreement with that uh, aspect. Uh, all right, so um, not not that that was wrong or anything. <laughs> Just say it. It reminded me that I meant to say that earlier. Uh, did I mention I'm passing a kidney stone? <laughs> I'm not concentrating super well. Uh, so yeah, so uh, I, I got started with level one about seven years ago or so, and I went from a nerd who liked to play with stuff alone to a nerd who got to play with stuff with some amazing people. I got to learn so much. Uh, and that is one of my favorite things about the maker movement is just how empowering it is when someone comes in the way I did or, or you know, way others on their, their paths have come in and they, they find this place where they're welcomed to ask questions, where it's okay to take things apart just to see how they work, where it is encouraged to do something crazy, like build a taco cannon, or Butterscotch, the robotic fire-breathing pony of doom. You can find her on YouTube. She took a blue ribbon at Detroit Maker Fair. Fantastic project. Uh, continually being worked on. Uh, we missed uh, Louisville Mini Maker Fair to come down here, um, oh, uh, which uh, should tell you how much we love this con, because <laughs> that's our local fair. Uh, make it fair, but uh, um, they've uh, been working on making butterscotch walk <laughs> because, yeah, uh, because a walking fire breathing pony of doom is even better. Uh, but this, you know, th we, uh, we worked on some serious projects as well. There was the White Star Balloon Project led by Dan Bowen, who uh, last I heard was working for Google Loon, which is the data. A balloon project where they uh, can fly balloons to provide wireless service to, to uh, communities that don't have the infrastructure. Uh, yeah, and they're in Puerto Rico currently uh, uh, doing that. So um, he was able to basically leverage 
this major project into a job, which is just fantastic. Uh, and now he works for Google uh, doing ballooning. But yeah, we were, we were trying to set a uh, world record for amateur ballooning. Unfortunately, like a week before we were pl planning to launch, after months of work, after building the best cryogenic test chamber in the city of Louisville, like seriously, companies came to us to use it because we could hold 40 below for 72 hours with test data uh, and a webcam. Uh, and nobody else could do that. Nobody else had the equipment to do that. We, we built that out of just yeah. crap we scrounged up and figured out how to make it work because that's what a hackerspace does. Because uh, we needed to test batteries, battery supplies to see what sort of batteries we could put in a balloon that would be in the jet stream at 40 below and still run for 72 hours. Because we had, uh, we took one of those uh, emergency GPS uh, satellite enabled uh, communicators, so if you get lost in the woods, you hit a button, they come rescue you. We took one of those apart to get the antenna out and then got time on the satellite network that that uses so that we could send text messages with science data from the balloon. Uh, I mean, all sorts of crazy stuff went into this. And then a week before we launch, uh, some guys in California doing alt uh, altitude balloons, one of them didn't pop, and they smashed every distance record for amateurs ever. Just, they, they went across the entire continental US and then I think it showed up in Europe or Africa or somewhere. So they went across the Atlantic, which was the record we were going for. They just, they went halfway around the world. <laughs> uh, but we still flew the balloon, it was fun. Uh, but you know, it, you know, so it's, it's a mix of the serious stuff and a, si a mix of the silly stuff and just a lot of educational stuff. I have learned a lot about the Arduino platform, which is microcontrollers for dummies, which is great because I can't always get Charles to do something for me. Charles is, uh, does all the stuff in embedded C. I don't know embedded C, but the Arduino library makes it possible to interact with the world in ways uh, that, that change people's perspectives on what they can do, which goes back to my earlier remark about uh, the empowering nature of the maker movement when you can teach someone how to use the Arduino and now they can do something cool. Uh, one of the projects I like to use is the, uh, uh, the Netflix and chill. So these days you can get a flat screen TV relatively cheaply and you can build a custom footbed, footwell for your bed and have a flat screen TV that then rises up out of it. But as cool as that is, just putting a button on it, eh, everyone, anyone could do that. So what if you could make your TV come out of your bed with the secret knock? Well, as it happens, the code to detect, detect that knock is already on um, the Arduino and open sourced online, which is why, how I know about it. And uh, so you can get an Arduino, download that code, tweak it to run a couple of motors and some limit switches, and build this box and have this TV that rises out of your bed when you do the secret knock or a magnetic ring or whatever you want, secret you know, thing you want to do to impress people uh, for a fraction of the money that it would have taken when I was a kid. This is the sort of thing that used to require you know, tens of thousands of dollars and an electrical engineer to build and prototype, and now you can do it for uh, you know a couple hundred bucks, you know, or less if you can scrounge for parts. It, it is fantastic. Um, so you've got tools like the Arduino that allow you to communicate with the world. You can sense for light or make light. You can sense for sound or make sound. You can, you know, vibration, the whole you know, movement, flexibility, distance, all these cool things. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, so while we're working on the White Star Balloon project. We were looking at the idea of building our own envelopes because um, hydrogen and helium envelopes are expensive. And if we could make our own, that would be great, but we needed to be able to detect leaks. And a hydrogen or helium detector is stupid expensive. We found a used one on eBay for 16 grand. We didn't know if it worked, and it was $16,000. Uh, so uh, one of the level one members, uh, Gary, comes in one day uh, with a happy birthday balloon. And he's like, well, I was thinking about our, uh, our leak detector problem, and uh, I had this old aquarium pump, and I came up with this thing. And what he had done is glued two pieces of PVC together, 
with some mirrors at the end to an ultrasonic distance sensor. And then he'd connected that to the aquarium pump. And he was passing air pumped by the aquarium pump through this tube. And uh, anyone want to raise their hand and tell me how it works? Because it, it, I didn't figure it out until he explained it either. So even with all that, I was like, and what does that do? Well, the ultrasonic distance sensor bounces sound. And in, when it hears the sound come back, it knows how far, it, you know, it, it does some math to see how long it took and it knows how far it was. When you change the gas ratio, the speed of sound in the atmosphere changes. So when he pokes a hole in this balloon and he turns this thing on, beep, 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 beep. Beep, 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 because it's changing the speed of sound and therefore the distance this thing sees. And for less than 20 bucks, he built a working leak detector that does the job we need. Because we don't really need to know, is it he hydrogen, is it helium? We just need to know, is it leaking here? Is the gas ratio changing? And he, he, you know, it is a privilege to hang out with people who, who come up with such uh, innovative solutions and teach me to think about the world in different ways. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so but going back to the empowering nature of the maker movement, uh, one of my favorite things to do is teach people. It's one of the reasons why Charles and I come down here uh, and I kind of hog the teaching side and make him do the money <laughs> so that I can teach people. Uh, I, I really love when, peop when, when, you, when you see that look in their, in their eyes when they're like, oh, I can do this. When, when they have that realization that, that they can make a thing, that they don't have to rely on someone else, that they can come up with their own idea and execute it. And uh, you know, while we're doing soldering here, at level one, there are so many tools. We've got the laser cutters and the 3D printers and the, the oscilloscopes and the wood shop and the metal shop and the welding and the milling machines and the, and the planers and all that fun stuff. So you've got people who are learning for the first time basic woodworking and making their own cutting boards and then taking that to the laser cutter and personalizing it. And then they can give that to somebody and say, uh, you know, not only did I make this for you, but I, I made it specifically for you and I did this artwork on it for you. Um, it, it, so you, you see people, they come in and they're like, wait, I can, I can use all these tools for free? And what I can do, I can do, I can do anything. <laughs> and, and that moment, I live for that. Uh, it, it, it is fantastic. Uh, anyone have any questions? <laughs> uh, anything you want me to ramble? Yeah, absolutely. What's the taco cannon? Oh, yes, the taco cannon. All right, so one of the cool things about being in a hackerspace is at 3 in the morning, the craziest conversations happen. <laughs> and... Um, uh, so Joe, I, I don't, I won't use his last name because I don't know if I have permission to. But Joe was there, one of our Joes, and he's there late at night, and he's tired, and he's laying in a in a chair, talking to some other people, and he's like, "I'm tired, and I'm also hungry. We should build a gun that makes and fires tacos, so I wouldn't have to get up. I could just like clap my hands or something, and it would know where I am, and it would just." make me a taco and fired at me yeah. <laughs> and so that became a popular idea and out of that came one of our ha hackathons a hackathon is uh, at, at level one is uh, where we have a a weekend on a theme and we all sit together and hack on something and the, this theme was make food not war and the entire idea was to make to, to make a thing that would make food and then deliver it to a hungry ha hacker. Uh, proud to say my team tied for first. Uh, the other guy who uh, tied with us, 3D printed a pulley system and uh, built a shot launcher. So he had a remote button he could press and it would fire a shot of some liquid that he would then catch in his stein and uh, you know, drink, consume. Uh, it was pretty cool. It was more impressive is that he could do it after the second one <laughs> and, still <ca> <laughs> and, and still catch it. <laughs> um, uh, uh, that's uh, one of our networking gurus who currently works for uh, 
a major uh, e-commerce company we've all known and used for buying anything and everything. Um, yeah, fantastic guy, very, very smart. One of these people you sit around and just learn from. Uh, we made a ice cream delivery system. Uh, I teamed up with some of my friends who were, at the time, worked at the Kentucky Science Center. So they had access to the liquid nitrogen doer. Uh, and one of the things they do there is they make liquid nitrogen ice cream for birthday parties and such. So we built a machine that we could put ingredients in and liquid nitrogen in and press a button and get it one of several types of ice cream um, made quickly because who wants to wait for ice cream? You're hungry. You don't want to wait for it to freeze. So you use liquid nitrogen. And uh, uh, we had chocolate, vanilla, and uh, habanero mango, which was uh, one I had to do because uh, I had that up in Columbus, Ohio once, and it was just the most delicious thing ever. Y you take a bite of it, and it's just smooth mango, and it's beautiful. And then as soon as you swallow, wham, that, that habanero gets you. And then you've got to take another bite because it hurts. <laughs> and the, mon and the, the mango is, you know, takes all the pain away. <laughs> I don't know why I have uh, no, that's not why I have kidney stones. Um, also, I, I don't do much of the habaneros as much anymore. Um, yeah, that was fun. Anyway, so we, uh, so they, they did the ice cream side, and I took an old compound bow somebody had thrown away, um, and it was slightly sketchy, and I made um, a, uh, what's, a ballista out of it, and we mounted the ice cream on the end of the ballista, and fired that down the alleyway. And ours was one of the successful ones that landed and was still edible. So that's, that's why we won. The taco cannon exploded. It just exploded taco everywhere. It was fantastic. It was, uh, it was absolutely a success. You know, it may sound like a failure that it exploded, but it was absolutely a success because it was very, very entertaining. <laughs> And uh, it, uh, it, you know, was the progenitor of the entire idea. Um, we're hosting a hackathon. Uh, when is that, Charles? November 3rd through 5th. Charles is hosting the Archer Hackathon. We're all fans of this uh, delightfully naughty animated series. And so, uh, th yeah, we're starting with Stir Friday on Friday night. And we'll be going through Sunday. Um, there's going to be a couple of categories you can win. You're going to be building devices uh, that you might see at an, a spy agency like ISIS. Uh, and there's going to be phrasing. Uh, that's how you get ants and uh, hostile work environment. Hostile work environment. <laughs> Those are going to be the three categories you can win. Uh, so if any of you guys want to make the trip up to Louisville at some point and join us for that, uh, you know, you'd be welcome to join us and, and just have fun with nerds. Uh, another really cool platform that we get to teach people about at the level one is the Raspberry Pi. Uh, it has made small Linux computers cheap and available in a way that was never possible before. And uh, the maker community at large, I was uh, the people who put that together, a, a, a pretty big debt of gratitude, I think, because now there's a plethora of these. But before, they were 90 to 150 bucks for anything remotely like it. And now, now you can put together a computer and give it to a kid and if they screw it up, eh, who cares? I mean, most likely the worst they're gonna do is damage the SD card. If they destroy the file system bad enough, you gotta put a new SD card in there. But you can encourage them to play with the GPIO and the hardware itself because even if they break that, it's not a big deal. It's not a $900 iPad. It's not a, a you know, $150 motherboard and $300 processor and $80 worth of RAM and you know, it's 25 bucks. If they physically break it, whoop de doo they learn something, go, go on. This is really empowering for people to build things like uh, Andy's got a magic mirror at the table. That's run on a Raspberry Pi, isn't it? Yeah. So. You can put stuff like this together, and it's not cost prohibitive. I think the screen is the most expensive part. 
and if you're careful, you can find one of those in a recycling bin somewhere, you know, because the stand is broken. whoop de doo you don't care, you don't want the stand. You're gonna be taking it out of the case anyway. Uh, so you can get a lot of this stuff for free and, and take it apart, rearrange it, make it do something useful, slap, you know, 50 bucks or less worth of hardware on there and bam, you have something where other people look at and they go, well, that's really cool. And then you go, yeah, I made that, you know, just kind of tossed that together the other day. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, so that is another super empowering tool that lets people communicate with the world in ways that, ju you know, I'm incredibly jealous. My, my, my teenage self is incredibly jealous of. Would have loved that when I was a kid. This, uh, this, this is a, like kind of a golden age for making cool stuff. How am I doing on time? How much more do I have to ramble is the question. Another half hour? Awesome. Uh, any question? Any more questions? Ah, all right. All right. So the question is about age range at level one. Uh, yeah. At our hacker space, uh, we are more kid tolerant than kid friendly. There are a couple of good maker-related uh, children's programs in town. There's a new children's maker space specifically in Louisville that I point people towards if they want to take kids to drop off for educational programs. However, uh, we generally tell people we're, we're, we're kid tolerant. If you want to bring your kids, understand they shouldn't be small enough to eat things off the floor because that is a very bad idea at our space. Um, and they need to be supervised directly with, with an adult. So if you want to bring your six-year-old there and you can keep your eye on them, and keep them out of trouble, then we're more or less okay with that. In fact, we're more okay with that than if you bring your 16-year-old, drop them off at the wood shop, and go sit on the couch and read a book. That will get you a conversation. No, you stand there, you stand there with the tool, with the kid, and watch them because, you know, yes, your 16-year-old your is very mature. Yes, they're very capable. No, it's not allowed. Uh, there will be uh, adult beverages, there will be adult languages, there will be the occasional R-rated movie or um, whatever on the screen. If you're okay with that, then, then by all means bring kids. Um, we do some programs where we're, that are aimed at kids on occasion. You, uh, it, we're all volunteer driven. So if a member wants to do something like that, they'll prob they, the general etiquette is to announce it quite in advance. Like, two weeks from now, at this time, I want to do a kind of a kid-friendly thing. Does anyone have any objections? If nobody else is planning on using the space and they're, they're, they're generally, you know, there's no promise that it's going to be kid-friendly because, again, we, we won't make that promise. We can't. Uh, but the community is pretty good about that. So um, if you're going to be doing something like that, then anyone who might be tempted to do something might go, oh, wait, yeah, they said they were going to do this. They're in the classroom. We'll do it in an hour when they leave. Uh, you know, uh, that said, the environment there is intentionally very welcoming. Um, one of the things that is different about our hackerspace than other hackerspaces that I have come to learn from people who, who have visited our space from other spaces is that our space is more focused on inclusivity than average. Um, we have a strong uh, GTFO attitude towards people who say uh, RTFM. If you're an RTFM kind of person, you're not welcome at our space. You are not in the right place. We are there to teach people. We are an educational nonprofit. We are not just a place for you to play with tools. We are a place for you to teach people. If you know something, share something. If you can't do that, we don't want to hang out with you. Uh, go somewhere else and we get that on occasion and they last a couple of weeks and they try their antics and it doesn't work nobody's impressed nobody engages with them and they get bored and they go away because uh, they, they they you know nobody finds them clever or amusing and nobody wants to be around them uh, our space is intentionally aimed at being inclusive to all forms of making we have five sewing machines, two sergers, and two embroidery machines. Because sewing is a part of making. And it's not a thing that we put in to attract women. And then like, all right, now girls will come to the space. We have sewing machines. Because that is not how you do that. 
that, that does not work. Uh, the sewing machine was bought by, the first sewing machine was brought into the space by the Rocket Club that started it using our space because their local university wouldn't give them any sort of faculty support. Until their second year, they built a rocket and took first place in a national competition, and then all of a sudden the school was like, look at our rocket club. <laughs> uh, I'm quite fond of the fact that we shamed an entire university into recognizing their, their engineering students' uh, rocket club. Uh, uh, I'm not going to name the university because I don't want to get, you know, I, I'm not trying to name and shame that much, but I, I'm quite fond of that story. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that, was, that was really cool. And the people who did that, uh, uh, one of them served as our vice president, I believe, uh, for a while. I mean, they're just fantastic people. They did a lot of, they did a lot of children outreach, um, teaching kids about rocketry and, and the engineering that goes into that. But uh, yeah, so they were the first ones to start doing sewing there. They were the ones to figure out that we needed a serger, which does a different type of stitching. It's, this is, I did not know what a serger was. My mom does quilting. Uh, I grew up around you know sewing and, and, and making it with uh, textiles. And so I thought I was fairly familiar with it. You know, my, she did cross stitch. She, did, uh, you know, I, I, she taught me to crochet. Um, I don't know how to knit, but, uh, um, you know, I learned a lot of this from my mom, but I didn't know what a serger was. It's a specialized tool. My mom couldn't afford or justify one, so it was never a topic of conversation. But, you know, so the, these guys were like, we need a serger. And I'm like, what the hell is that? It's a special type of sewing machine. Well, I'm going to look it up, spend some time on Wikipedia, look at a couple of YouTube videos. Oh, that's really cool. So that's where they get the stitching on my shirt from. Uh, it, you know, it comes from a, a serger. Uh, which does a different type of stitch, which is more durable. So if I want to make my own clothes, I can go to level one and make them more durably than I can on my uh, 1956 Singer at home. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I will. I haven't yet because I, I haven't come up with any patterns or free time. Free time. I think I have that on the schedule in 2036. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, but... Yeah, you know, we, we, we encourage artists to attend our space. Um, I've, I met several people when, you know, we're giving tours. Uh, oh, I'm not, I'm not really a nerd. I just do painting. Oh, no, no, please come in. Teach us how to paint. We had a Bob Ross hackathon. <laughs> we watched a bunch of Bob Ross. When that, when that uh, dropped on U YouTube or Netflix or whatever it was, we, we had a hackathon where we played those all weekend and uh, painted things. Uh, I did a sailboat. Because you know, I didn't want to do a happy tree. I, I'm my long-term goal is to get a nice uh, catamaran. It's about two and a half million dollars, but boy, is it pretty. Anyway, <laughs> and it's fast. It, it is. Uh, here's what excites me about this boat. I'm a slightly side uh, DV. Uh, it is as if Lamborghini built an RV with four queen-size berths that still did 200 miles an hour. It is an astounding piece of beautiful technology from a technical point to an aesthetic point. That's why I like this boat. Uh, yeah, the company's called Gunboat. You can look it up on YouTube. Uh, they, they had to make new race classes for them because they're too fast. <laughs> they make them out of the same materials that they make racing boats out of, but they make them in a cabin cruiser configuration. So you end up with a cabin cruiser that does 19 knots comfortably instead of nine knots screaming and everyone holding on, wishing, uh, hoping not to die. It's an incredible piece of engineering. Uh, and we're all nerds, so we, we appreciate that stuff, right? Uh, anyway, yeah, so uh, that's what I painted. But, uh, you know, making encompasses all sorts of things. And, and um, by having an inclusive community, you are able to match people uh, like Sean, who I, I can definitely talk about, um, who will be the first one to tell you he has not a creative bone in his body. He can make pretty much anything out of pretty much anything. It, one of his nicknames from just about everyone who's ever met him is MacGyver, because that is what he does. He's really good at it. But he doesn't have a single creative bone, and he, he'd be the first to tell you, I have no idea what to make. So what he does, he hangs out at the space, and we have an artist or somebody come in, and they have no idea how to make a thing, but they don't want to make it. They're like, so, uh, hey, I got this idea. I want to do this. Who wants to help me? And Sean raises his hand and jump right in there. And between the two of them, they collaborate, and they build some really cool art project. 
and then we get you know a lot of community acclaim and it's on Hackaday and blah 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 and you know that sort of collaboration is why hacker spaces especially uh, should be inclusive places because simply having tools does not enable you to create that kind of cultural art. It doesn't allow you to create in that way. You need to have tools and a community that is focused on bringing all these makers together and then combining their varied skill sets in new and creative ways. Because, um, you know, while, while Sean's says he doesn't have a creative bone in his body, you know, he's interacted with enough artists to understand art in a, in a very fundamental way. He's had an education that way through practical hands-on use. And the artists he's working with are getting an education in uh, the practical aspects of engineering. Um, I'll give you another example. Uh, there was a young woman who came who was a metal sculptor, very talented. I saw her work, it was, it was beautiful. Um, she was interested in the nerdy stuff, but had never really done much with it. Uh, she started hanging out at our space, and within six months, she was heavily modifying our 3D printers and teaching classes on them. You know, she, she knew nothing about them coming in other than that they were a cool thing and that we had one. And this is at a time when 3D printers were persnickety pain in the butt. Uh, they... Yeah, they, 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 we say they still are now. We still, we still call them disappointment machines because they manufacture that more than anything else. <laughs> but, uh, but they were worse, especially cheap home built ones. Uh, you know, there were, there was a time when it took specialized knowledge to get it to do anything reliably, and she was there teaching that specialized knowledge. To, you know, several times a week to anyone who wanted to learn, and maintaining the machines. It was. Um, you know, there's just countless stories where because of the the nature of our space, you know, someone comes in and they just jump to it and before you know it, they know all sorts of things. And I, I include myself in that. I, uh, I didn't know anything about Arduino. I didn't know anything about Raspberry Pi. I don't think Pi had been invented yet. Um, I knew what a capacitor was. I knew what a transistor was, I knew what a resistor was, but I knew th just the basics. I could identify them, I knew more or less what they did. The most complex circuit I could deal with was an op amp. You know, uh, but now I hang out with Charles and I have become an expert at surface mount soldering and I get to teach all sorts, you know, literally hundreds of people now to solder and uh, we have designed these kits that are specifically designed to be, you know, beginner friendly, and it has uh, completely transformed my world and my perspective. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. So the, uh, the question was, what was the worst outcome and then uh, some in something in terms of catastrophic and dangerous? Um, we've been very fortunate in our space in that nothing really d uh, dangerous has occurred with any injuries. Uh, I would say the worst outcomes are some of our failures uh, to maintain our excellent community. Uh, before we had a... Uh, you know, we, uh, you know, going back to my comments on, on Jason's talk, before we had a harassment policy, we had to have that conversation ourselves, and it was not an easy one, and it was not a gentle one. There was a lot of, uh, that was one of the most acrimonious and, and the most uh, uh, difficult conversations we had as a community. Uh, there were some people who were just vociferously opposed for various reasons. Uh, and we had a couple of people leave the community entirely over it. Uh, one of them, ironically, is e extremely into libertarian and free rights and self-directed societies and does not see the irony of leaving a self-directed society. <laughs> that, that picked a direction he didn't like. Uh, because uh, it didn't pick the direction he thought it should. But, uh, yeah, so I would say that situations like that where 
people have not been comfortable at our space are the most catastrophic because they, they do more damage than a tool being dropped or, or a project being broken. Uh, because that stuff can be fixed way easier. But having a young woman who got a makership, which is I'll tell you, a program I'll tell you about in just a second, who will never come back to our space, that is a stain on our, our legacy uh, because of the actions of one person. You know, that, uh, but, you know, we now have the protections in place for that. And the, the people, the, you know, we have had a couple of people that are permanently banned from the space. And we have had one person who behaved in ways that were not acceptable before who now toes the line because he knows where the line is. And that is one of the reasons why I, I stand with Jason. You know, these things are important. They will keep, you know, like, you know, they don't apply to most people. They don't apply to me. You know, it's, it's, I'm never going to do anything that, that violates this. I don't need it. It's not for me. I shouldn't complain about it. It's for the people who need it on both ends. The people who need to be protected from it and the people who need to be reminded this will not be tolerated. You know, uh, and so uh, we've seen a vast improvement. Uh, so in terms of catastrophes, that's, that's the biggest one I can think of is, is, and it still breaks my heart, that, that young woman will never join our community again. And she was working on some really cool stuff and she was very smart and, and uh, very talented. And yeah, in, in my opinion, that's one of the biggest catastrophes in our space. Uh, we're very fortunate no one has been physically hurt uh, in any serious way. We've done some stuff that is questionable <laughs> from time to time, but uh, our, motto is prob one of our, our motto is probably safe because a lot of what we do is probably safe, but we try to be very smart about how we do probably safe things. Um, one that had the potential for this, I can tell you about, is when we took the nine inch spacer out of our Bridgeport mill. We have a Bridgeport mill on loan from a very kind person, and it, was, it had a nine inch spacer and it was set up for vertical milling, but we don't need a vertical mill. So we got permission from the owner to remove this nine inch spacer. The top end of this mill, and it is a very large mill, is extremely heavy. So picking it up off the spacer, removing the spacer and putting it back down was a non-trivial thing. We had a lot of uh, safety contingencies in place, because if this went wrong, it was gonna go wrong in a very bad way. And someone was, could potentially be very seriously injured. Uh, that, that could have been on that list, but fortunately it went, it went uh, unnaturally smooth. <laughs> like we got done with that and we're like, that went like we know what we're doing. What happened? <laughs> uh, we have had, um, I think, one electrical component burnout from too much current through it recently. But by and large, our community is pretty fantastic and tends to keep things pretty, I mean, like we do stuff, we set things on fire. When I, when I go to places to represent level one, one of the questions I ask is, can I bring something that, bur that burns? <laughs> can I bring butterscotch and spit 15 foot fire? No? Oh, it's indoors, you say? <laughs> uh, uh, Stuff like that, uh, but we do it in a way that's been pretty safe. Uh, unfortunately, not all hackerspaces um, have this. There's a uh, f uh, crowdfunding campaign for a gentleman who was hurt by a freak explosion at his hackerspace. Uh, I don't remember the details. Again, kidney stone, tired, rambling. But uh, you can search for that and contribute if, if you like. Um, he was burned pretty badly when a propane tank ex exploded. Um, Oh, the makership program I mentioned. All right, so makership is another one of the really cool things we do at our space. Uh, it is a member-driven thing. All of our stuff is member-driven. Our officers are there for legal compliance issues, and that's about it. The president can't tell you what to do any more than any other member, uh, you know, more or less. Uh, now, there will be times the president may have to pull someone aside and be like, uh, you're coming really close to some behavior that's not excellent towards others, and our rule is to be excellent towards the others, so could you pretty please be excellent towards others? Uh, but any member can do that to anyone else. It doesn't have to be the president. It's not the president's sole burden or responsibility. Uh, it just happens to fall on the people who are there the, 
you know, and active the most, which the president tends to be one of those people, uh, president, vice president, one of the board of directors, et cetera. Um, uh, but one of our past presidents, uh, uh, after, I think it was after his presidency was over, just as one of our members, he decided to do a member initiative, which uh, is how we work. It's a duocracy. If you want to do something, you, you know, make sure it's cool with everybody and do it. Uh, if you think it's going to be disruptive, if it's if you don't think it's going to be disruptive, you don't have to ch you know really check with everyone. But uh, he started this uh, scholarship program for the space, and uh, there's a application. Uh, I help run this program now uh, since he doesn't come to meetings as much. He had a kid, and uh, so you know we're like see you in three years. <laughs> I've got two boys. I know what it's like. We'll see you in three years when they're old enough for you to get enough sleep and come out and be social again. Uh, so uh, I've been helping him run this program for a couple of years, but he founded this program. It's entirely driven by donations from the membership, uh, in particular one anonymous donor who I'd like to thank. Um, and we are able to give a scholarship to people who fill out an application and uh, win the approval of a panel of self-selecting members. So um, Chris will, will post to the mailing the members mailing list and say, "All right, we've got to make a ship application. Who wants to help evaluate it?" Some members will say, "I'm in. I've got time this week." Then they'll read the applications. They'll pick their favorite project. They'll make sure that this project isn't going to do anything dangerous to the space, um, you know, harm our reputation or, or you know, damage tools or you know, create a bad smell or whatever. And then uh, uh, that uh, that person is able to go through our normal membership process. It's not a shortcut. So you still have to go come to meetings. You still have to show us that you're not an ax murderer, that you're going to get along with people, and uh, that you understand what our community is like. Because uh, we've had a couple people join that think we're more like one of the commercial shops where you pay 50 bucks, you use tools, you go home, and uh, someone else cleans up after you. And that is not what level one is. There's no paid staff. Um, as I said before, we're, we're a service organization. We're a community organization. We're volunteers. Uh, our, our job is to keep the space free and open to the public uh, and, and make it for them. So anyway, uh, you come to a couple of meetings. You convince us that you're, you should be a member. And then you get three months membership paid for. And you get a $100 stipend that you can turn in receipts towards your project to get reimbursed on. And uh, it wasn't intended this way, but it was one of our more successful outreach programs for in terms of gaining a more diverse uh, group of makers, in particular women. I think they're 52 percent. It was higher, but it's it's gone down because we last several mem recipients have been men. Um, but you know, our our one of our past presidents, she got a makership uh, to build a light sensitive. Uh, musical instrument that she was going to use at the science center she worked at at the time uh, to show kids stuff. And, you know, that got her into the space, and eventually she became president. Uh, we've, you know, it's been a great way of getting people involved. And again, it's not funded through club dues. It's entirely through donations. Uh, yeah, that's a really cool thing. Uh, next question. Subject you want me to ramble about? Uh, I can tell you stories about various projects. Well, all right, when, at my house or at level one? Four. It, it, all right, so I am a bit of a pack rat. <laughs> and I am convinced I can fix almost anything because I've fixed most everything. Uh, but occasionally, uh, yeah, I used to have a habit of holding on to stuff like that. But now uh, I have level one, and level one has a boneyard. And the boneyard is where you take stuff like that, and other people take it apart and take what they want out of it. And then every six months or so, we go through and throw a bunch of that away anyway. If it's been sitting there a while, we just throw it all away. Yeah, we're getting ready to have another uh, uh, hackathon where, where, you know, again, we're volunteers. So we put the call out, like, this is the thing we need to do. Our space is getting cluttered back here. We need to clean it out. Who's going to show up at this date, at this time? You know, someone will buy pizza. And, uh, and uh, we'll do... Um, uh, we'll, we, you know, we'll clean out the boneyard. Uh, we'll try to get rid of the stuff that's in our ju in whoever's there judgment not as useful. Uh, and then 
uh, you know, we'll go back to collecting crap. Uh, but I, uh, a lot of stuff in the boneyard ended up getting repurposed in interesting ways. Um, we've had uh, old game controllers taken apart and used for things. Uh, uh, Butterscotch, for example, has a Wiimote uh, controller to control where she breathes fire. So when, when she was made as a toy, before we turned her into something more epic, uh, her programming taught her to turn towards sound. <laughs> and when you have a flamethrower, this is a bad idea. <laughs> uh, um, I guess that might go back to your question, though. Uh, one of the dumber things I saw anyone do is someone lit a cigarette off butterscotch and did not have eyelashes, eyebrows, or a chunk of hair. <laughs> uh, he wasn't hurt, but he did m lose some hair. It, <laughs> it didn't get burned, which was a miracle, but, <laughs> but it smelled awful. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, we do a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, people have done thermite demonstrations. Uh, people have taken propane and bubbles and made that lovely bubbles where you, you scoop them up and then light them on fire and they burn out of your hand. Uh, and it doesn't actually burn your hand. <laughs> Should I have not given you that idea, Red? <laughs> Uh, make sure you look it up. I, I'm not 100% if it was propane or something else. There's a couple of them that are, are safer than others. Yeah, uh, yeah. maybe it was butane. Uh, there, there, are, there are a couple that are hand safe, and there are a couple... Uh, well, there is one cool thing uh, that I saw online where someone had taken a wooden um, CNC'd or, or somehow cut out uh, template, and they had a bubble machine, which was just making bubbles full of propane and they would get they they were being pushed up through there and they had a thing they would slice it off and then it would just kind of drift up in the air and then they'd hit it with a lighter and it <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah so yeah our current president took uh his old cnc machine uh which was a home-built device he built um and then brought into level one before we got our own CNC machine from a grant money that we got. One of the perks of being a 501c educational nonprofit um, is that we get grants as such. And uh, he built one of those uh, Zen Garden uh, CNC machines so he can draw on the sand various things. Uh, oh, I will tell you a little bit about becoming a 501c3 as a hackerspace. It is um, challenging. Especially when they look at your website and they say you're having too much fun, which is an actual problem that the uh, IRS will have with you. Uh, because places where you go to have fun are clubs, and they are not value they are not allowed to be 501c3s. It's a club, not a you know. It's a it's a it's, you know it's a hangout. You don't get to be a nonprofit. So we had to carefully document all of our educational outreach stuff, like the teaching soldering and. Uh, the various workshops we've had at our space, which include urban chicken husbandry, microprocessor programming, rocketry, retirement planning, uh, uh, making your own essential oils, um, everything you can think of, <laughs> uh, various things, uh, all, all sorts of stuff um, uh, has been taught there. Uh, and and then basically going back to the IRS and like look at all of the educational stuff they do we do and then they're like all right we're finally we're we're convinced you you do educational stuff and fun stuff <laughs> but that I I think helps I mean it's one thing to go to a place and learn about microcontrollers like um, a, a university class and I'm not wanting to knock university classes they're very useful and all that for a lot of people. If you want to reach Charles' level, it's probably a, one of the better strategies. But if you don't need to be an EE, you just want to do something cool with an Arduino, uh, coming to a, a hackerspace and doing something fun with it will get you in and get you knowledge that you wouldn't get through just a dry uh, uh, run-through of the various technical terms and blah, blah, blah. Uh, 
uh, you know, you, when, you, when you give someone a cool idea, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a woman I know, a friend of uh, my oldest son's mother. Uh, did I mention I was an idiot? Uh, yeah, I've been an idiot. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, she, one of her friends is a really cool lady, and she has an idea for a project, and she wanted to give it to me. And she's like, here, you just go do this. And I'm like, uh, you know what the optics are like for a white guy taking a black woman's idea and making money off of it? <laughs> uh, and she's like, ha ha, you're silly. And I'm like, but no, seriously, come by level one and do this. This is the thing you can do. And uh, I'm looking forward to having that moment with her that I started this talk off with where, where she sees, oh, I can do this. Because she's not a dumb lady. She's wicked smart. Uh, She's just never been put in a situation where she's been empowered to do these ideas. And, you know, it's one of my goals is to get her in there and get her an Arduino and get her started on this project. I don't care if she actually makes it. I don't care if she actually, you know, makes a business out of it. I just want to see her go, holy shit, I can do this. One more time. All right, we're done. Oh yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that, that's my time. I'm gonna go back to the corner and teach people to solder. If you want to learn, uh, we have kits. If you don't have one, if you do have one, I'll be happy to teach you that one. Uh, if you want to ask more questions, uh, I, I will ramble all day. <laughs> Thank you very much.